Jeremy Veldman with the Memphis Astronomical Society. Welcome to another episode of Telescope Tips. Once again, I'm joined by Rick Honey, our president. And today we got a very important topic to discuss, and that's the topic of eyepieces. And I got to tell you, this is a pretty comprehensive subject in and of itself. And I doubt we'll be able to cover everything we need to in one episode. We could have several episodes on this, but we're going to co cover some of the basics, some of the fundamentals, some of the things you need to know about eyepieces. And this is something I learned as I got started also in amateur astronomy. Um, dabble and delve into the realm of eyepieces slowly but surely because both Rick and I have spent a considerable amount of, how should we say, capital on accumulating our set of eyepieces. So, Rick, let's talk about some of the basic fundamentals first when it comes to eyepieces. And there's low power and there's high power. So, quick math here. When you're evaluating the power of a telescope, it's essentially the focal length of the objective divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So long story short, the, the, the lower the number in terms of the eyepiece length, the higher the power. Absolutely. So, and, and really, when you're getting started, you want to start with a good low power eyepiece first. That's uh, counterintuitive to what most people think. You think you're buying a telescope for its magnification. The truth is that's one of the things that disappoints people quickest first is too high magnification of the telescope and now the view isn't very good and you're disappointed. But you need a low power, good wide field of view to start really understanding what it is you're looking at and taking the best uh, uh, out of the optics of the telescope. Uh, a good for, for long, there, there are two fundamental types of telescopes in the world. There are hundreds of variations on this. They're either short focal length or they're long focal length. Short focal length telescopes in general are good for wide fields of view, deep space objects, other galaxies, other gas clouds, we call them nebula, um, that sort of thing. Long focal length telescopes are best for planetary work like Jupiter and Saturn, Mars, the Moon. Um, and of course, with that said, there's all kinds of variations in between. One of my first telescopes actually did both uh, by changing the secondary mirror. But the, uh, a good starting place for both long and fo short focal length telescopes is an eyepiece somewhere in the mid-20s, say a 25 millimeter uh, eyepiece. Uh, that's, that gives you a good wide field of view on a, on a long focal length telescope like a schmidt cassegrain or, or a refractor that's very long and it also gives you a very, an even wider field of view with a short focal length telescope like a Dobsonian or a, uh, something in the F4 range. So, that's a good place to start. Work your way down from there. Uh, yeah, you start with a low power eyepiece, literally, and work your way down. Now, a really good low power wide field of view eyepiece is actually the 31 millimeter Nagler. However, it can also be pretty costly to either get a Nagler or an Ethos. Right. So when I got started, I actually went with the 20 millimeter Explore Scientific as my preferred low power eyepiece. Now, 20 millimeter, that's kind of like right on the border between low and medium power. But this is pretty cost effective. It's made by Explore Scientific. It's a good alternative to maybe a Nagler or an Ethos if you don't want to spend that kind of money. And I certainly have gotten some really good use out of this particular eyepiece. And uh, again, it's a cost effective solution. So, talk about maybe your preferred low power eyepiece. Well, I tell you, Jeremy, I was, and I mentioned it a minute ago, when I first got started, I figured out this deal about long and focal length telescopes, and then I thought, well, I don't want to have to choose. I, you know, I want a telescope that does both. What a disappointment. Well, it turns out Parks uh, Corporation built one that did both. You change out the secondary mirror, and it became an F3.5 Newtonian, which is a very a uh, wide field of view Newtonian or a fast Newtonian or with a different secondary mirror it was an F13 Cassegrain 
It's a very long focal length telescope, and it was absolutely great for planetary work and also for wide fields of view and photography. But it came with a bunch of inch and a quarter plossels. It, it didn't come with a bunch, it came with two. It came with a 25 and a 10. And I used those for quite a while, but I've always worn glasses. I've had bad eyesight all my life. Probably one of my fascinations with optics comes from trying to be able to see better. Uh, and these glasses are not bad. I've had operations on my eyes. My glasses I actually one time became unmakeable, which is why I wound up having to have operations on my eyes. So they were thick. Um, I couldn't see anything without them. I've still got an astigmatism, but it was even worse then, which meant I couldn't take my glasses off and get up next to the eyepiece and compensate for my bad eyesight by just focusing. If you've got an astigmatism, it's just not gonna work. If you don't have an astigmatism, take your glasses off and refocus the telescope. <clears throat> so if you've gotta keep your glasses on, the next most important feature is what's called eye relief and it's basically how far you can be from the eyepiece itself and still get in focus and these uh, plossels are pretty good uh, orthos and kellners are terrible about that um, but the naglers had tremendous eye relief and my first nagler eyepiece was a nine millimeter Nagler. I was able to pick it up uh, used for like $120, I think. And, and even back then, which was this is going to be in the uh, early 2000s, uh, this was um, two and a quarter, I think, new then. So I was able to pick it up at a good price, and this has been to this day my favorite eyepiece. I love looking at Jupiter through my Dobsonian with this thing. This is a wide field of view with a good high powered eyepiece. It gives me wonderful planetary views. Yeah, and you actually let me borrow that eyepiece when I first bought my Dobsonian, and I, I hadn't even started buying my set of eyepieces yet, so that was one of the first eyepieces that I used on my telescope, so thank you. And that's actually a good way, if you just got a telescope, to kind of dabble in the world of eyepieces. Go to an observing session, get with a veteran amateur astronomer, borrow some of their eyepieces first and try them out on your telescope. We promise we'll let you borrow our eyepieces. Just don't drop them. Don't drop them <laughs> and make sure you return them, right? So you like the 9mm Nagler. In fact, you really like the Nagler set. I picked up a 13mm Nagler from my uh, Teleview not long ago. So this has been a really good eyepiece also. That's interesting because this too is a 13mm Nagler. Oh, that's interesting. Very, this very is the two-inch version. This one's very. This one's old. This is this is a much newer Type Six. Yeah. This, this is, is a Type Two. You got a two-inch. I got an uh, inch and a quarter. Right. So, but they're, they're they're basically the same eyepiece. So, and I tell you, the one I went with. This is really my go-to eyepiece now for most of my observing sessions. And this is the 13 millimeter Ethos. The Ethos is the step up from the Nagler. This is a hundred degree field of view. The Naglers, I believe, are 82. But uh, this is a pretty expensive eyepiece, but you know I use this probably 90% of the time now when I'm at observing sessions um, for deep sky objects. Now, if I need a, a lower power, wider field of view, then I got to go to a you know a higher number. But I've got a lot of mileage out of the 13 millimeter Ethos. That's a, that's an excellent point. In fact, I have had I have bought and sold eyepieces, and I found that one eyepiece of a certain uh, focal length and another one, the same of a different focal length but a wider field of view, turned out that I didn't need the, the lower powered eyepiece because the higher powered eyepiece with the wider field of view gave me the same field of view as the low powered eyepiece but at a higher magnification. So there's that trade off to be looked at when you're looking at eyepieces. And that's a good reason why you might want to try these in your own telescope. I'm an expert on what works well in a culture 13 inch. Uh, but then I've had this telescope for 25 plus years. And uh, 
So I've, I've, I've played with them. One of my favorite eyepieces for this telescope. In fact, you'll notice perhaps that there is no finder on this telescope. I use a tail rad as a heads-up display type of gun sight finder. There's no magnification here at all. But it puts a red dot on the background sky so I can see where it's generally pointed. Then I take this relatively inexpensive Orion 32 millimeter Arfa design eyepiece. The thing has got a huge piece of glass on it. It's not a great eyepiece. In fact, it's uh, it's got astigmatism. Uh, you can, I'll tell you how to uh, tell what that is. Looks like one day, but uh, but it's great. it's like putting you put this in here. It's like putting in a small TV screen. You know, you just get this little view of the world as it goes past the front of the telescope. And uh, it's great for locating the objects you're trying to find and then zooming in on it with one of the really good eyepieces. So you use the Erfel really to hone in on the object that you want to look at and then you crank up the power from there with your 9mm to really zoom in on it. Right? Absolutely. And that 9mm is great for planetary, especially, like Jupiter. Yes. And the rings of Saturn. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the polar caps on Mars. The polar caps on Mars, phases of Venus. Right. I mean, it's a great planetary eyepiece. My 16 millimeter Nagler is my favorite high magnification for uh, nebula and most of the other galaxy stuff. Uh, you lose light the higher the magnification you go, so uh, things can get too dim if you go to too high power. Yeah, let's talk about when you go up to high power too, because again, this is kind of counterintuitive. People buy a telescope, they want to crank it up and really mag you know, increase the magnification, but you're also increasing some of the distortion effects um, that come along with seeing too, like a transparency. We talk about transparency in the atmosphere, if you've got you know, marginal seeing conditions. So if you're going to crank the power up, you're also going to crank up Maybe if you don't have the best seeing conditions, you're going to crank up the distortion as right. well. Absolutely. In fact, the worse the, the night, the, the, the more you're going to want to stay away from your high-powered eyepieces. We'll have a talk, actually, this next month about seeing uh, and what that means in astronomy. Uh, most people think of seeing as atmospheric effects, and that's certainly a large part of it, but there's a lot more there are a lot more things that will disappoint you, that'll, that'll cause you to be disappointed in the view you're getting through your telescope than just the atmospheric conditions. Uh, for example, a telescope like this, or anything of this size, carrying it to the observing station. Uh, of course, for me, it's easy. I throw this in the back of my truck, I open up all the windows on my camera shell, so that it gets airflow through it so the back of the truck doesn't get too hot. I to keep my mirror in a set, actually transported separately in another case, but it's, uh, uh, I try to keep it from getting too cold or too hot so that once I get where I'm going, the optics stabilize quickly. So that's one thing. We've got uh, optics that have got to get cool and stabilized. Uh, the actual currents, the air currents inside the telescope tube itself can have It takes a while to actually get to a point where it's stable and you're ready to roll, right? Essentially an hour. Just about any telescope is going to take at least an hour to stabilize. Yeah. Uh, some longer than that. So. You want to get that mirror out there. I got a mirror box for my job too. I pull the top off of it. It's going to take a while for the, uh, you know, the, the environmental conditions inside the mirror box to stabilize with what's going on outside so that you have. You know, you don't have those air currents over your mirror causing distortion effects. Right. And those all get magnified when you go to high power. In fact, I have an 8 millimeter ethos that I spent quite a bit of money on. I rarely use this eyepiece, ironically enough. Nothing against this particular eyepiece, but I just get more mileage out of a, a slightly lower power in terms of, you know, what I'm able to see. So, you know... I'm going to have to borrow that from you next time. We're <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Try it in this but I, you know, I've slowly accumulated, and I'm still building my set, but I have enough here now to get through pretty much any observing session. But I've got Explore Scientific, I've got Ethos, I've got Nagler, I've even got a couple of the Meads that I'm trying out, 100 Field of View. 
So, I mean, there's a lot of different brand names, and I'm not necessarily personally loyal to any one brand. Some people are. Um, but, you know, Rick, you've, you've really, over the years, you've, you've, you've also accumulated a lot of different brands of eyepieces, but there's one in particular that you kind of have a preference for. Well, I'm, I'm a Nykler. I'm not, I'm not just a Nykler fan. I'm a Teleview fan. And Teleview is a, Nykler is a certain model series in the Teleview brand. Uh, Al Nagler designed all their eyepieces, and he's a brilliant optical engineer, and uh, and I've just become quite the fan. Uh, I'm not sure that they're all made in America anymore. In fact, I'm pretty sure they're not. But I'm I'm sure that Teleview, their primary business is eyepieces. Where for the rest of these companies, their primary business is something else, and they just sell eyepieces to go with them. Meads, Lestron, uh, Orion. They all sell good quality, especially when you talk about plosses. In fact. No matter what you're doing, you will not go wrong investing in a nice set of Plossel eyepieces, full range from, say, at least 25 down to 10 millimeter. 25, 20, 15, 10, uh, get you a nice set of, of Plossels. And, and Mead sells with sets, uh, Celestron does, Orion does. Uh, I have a set of, of Televues, uh, and that way, no matter what telescope you wind up with. See, I, I use uh, my fossils in this little uh, ETX all the time. Uh, sometimes I'll use one of those in these. And, and then, of course, uh, I'll put where that camera is on the uh, guide scope, on that telescope, I'll use fossil eyepieces in it sometimes. So they're, hand, they're utilitarian. That's the best go-to set of utilitarian eyepieces you can have, a small set of, of colossal design eyepieces. So you buy a brand new telescope or maybe a used one, you're just getting into astronomy, you need a set of eyepieces to kind of get yourself going, you don't want to break the bank in terms of your budget, you recommend the Plossels as a starting point. Absolutely. You'll you keep them on hand for the rest of your life, you'll find some useful them somewhere, if, even if you don't use them often. Yeah, very good. Well, again, guys, we've got a lot to cover on eyepieces, so I doubt this is going to be our last episode, but certainly want to get it out there to get you familiar. Rick has had extensive experience accumulating eyepieces. He's actually done a little better than me in terms of budget because most of his are used. So he's, uh, he's done a better job at saving money than, you know, than I have, but they're a critical component to your optics. You know, your telescope is the, the light bucket that gathers the light, whether it's mirrors or lenses. Most of us have reflector designs that use mirrors, but in terms of the image, it's the eyepiece. That's the, you know that's how you contrive the optics to actually form an image and see something. So the eyepiece is where all the action happens. Jeremy makes a good point too. I, most of my eyepieces are used. I think only one, my 16 millimeter Nagler, I broke down and bought myself for a birthday present one time that I bought new. But the rest of them I picked up used. And if you're careful. Uh, Fortunately, our, our hobby isn't one where a lot of uh, uh, people trying to take advantage of other people are hanging out. So um, even eBay is not a bad place to buy this stuff, but uh, there's uh, Astro Mart and uh, I think uh, Cloudy, Nights Cloudy Nights has got a, a, a page where you can buy and sell stuff. Those are great places to shop for uh, secondhand uh, telescopes and equipment. Memphis has absolutely no one here selling telescopes and astronomy stuff. So uh, you're going to have to buy online anyway. So get uh, get out there and start looking around. You can find what you want secondhand. And typically, unfortunately, half price is about what you're going to pay half to three quarters is what you're going to wind up paying for a used piece of telescope gear that's in good shape. Yep. Uh, that's the good news if you're buying used, the bad news if you're trying to sell used. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the idea, you're going to have to sell at a discount, but Astromart is a good website, Cloudy Nights if you're looking for used equipment, and of course eBay is always an option, and then I've gone to Opcorp to buy some some of my new equipment. Yeah, so. I've 
do stuff. Uh, I've had lighting. very good experience with them. OPTCORP.com, I believe, is the website. So, very good. But, you know, being a part of the Memphis Astronomical Society or, ne or a group like this is also beneficial because you get to network with other people who are involved in the hobby, and that's how we get a lot of our equipment used at a discount. So it's a great way to get your first telescope and then also start accumulating your, your set of eyepieces. That's so, right. Again, Rick, I want to thank you for joining us in this episode. My pleasure. And uh, guys, I want to remind you that the Memphis Astronomical Society meets once a month, first Friday of the month, Christian Brothers University, Assessi Hall, room 155, and our meetings start at 8 o'clock p.m. And again, we conduct two dark sky observing sessions if the weather's clear at a location in Northwest Mississippi. And if you'd like to learn more about our group and how you can get involved, join, uh, visit our website at memphisastro.org. And if you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Memphis Astron Society. For Rick Honey, I'm Jeremy Feldman. We'll see you guys on our next episode of Telescope Tips.